two organizations which have invited you today are uh, Tele and VPK. Um, most of you will know them in Germany, for those who don't and those who have joined us. By the way, we are live streaming this at the moment over Ustream, so those who are joining us um, on the web. Um, Tele is the German Association of Science and uh, Technical, Technical Publishing or Technical Writers. Founded 82 years ago, if I have calculated correctly, as a journalist association. Tele sees itself today more as a forum um, uh, for dialogue between both sides of the desk, uh, between journalism and PR, media science and industrial research. Um, and one of the co founders, uh, Tele, is of the European Association of Science Journalists, OISIA. Um, I've written down that the main objective, objective of Tele then and now is to improve the understanding of science and innovation in society by monitoring the developments critically, if you want scientific literacy. Yeah. The other organization uh, uh, is VPK, Wissenschaftspressekonferenz, translated this as Science Writers Guild, founded 25 years ago. In Bonn, where uh, still the office is located, um, VPK was founded with the objective to foster an independent, responsible science journalism. And VPK has done so at more than 500 press conferences in the last few years, um, field trips, visits at research facilities, etc. One of the main goals of the organization is to ask for the message behind the scientific message, if you want, the hidden agenda in research and science, so to speak. Um, yeah, which somehow is also what we are trying to do today, if you want, yeah, to uh, open a discussion about the implications and the consequences of uh, science, science and the scientific process and work moving onto the Web 2.0, or is it into the Web 2.0, whatever. Um, and uh, I'm joined here today with um, uh, by two colleagues, and two other colleagues are going to join us over Skype. Um, I will introduce them to you a few minutes, unfortunately, uh, due to health reasons, they were not able to come to Germany. Um, I've got them here on my screen, and we're going to beam them onto the um, onto the wall later. So, um, for a short introduction, what happened so far, as they call it in sequels, um, we had for decades what we call peer reviewing, the peer reviewing process as a core element of scientific work. All of you know that, uh, of course. It is there to assure quality, to assure a certain standard of relevance, if you want, of the scientific findings. However, peer reviewing itself um, has also been increasingly criticized in the past few years due to its lack of transparency. The whole process um, is not free of manipulation, if you want. There are certain questions that arise, and uh, which is what brought us then to new approaches like open access, for instance, where you see uh, public peer reviewing, if you want, nowadays, um, an open discussion within the community until the paper is published in the end. But open access, as we all know it and have known it for years, was actually just the beginning of a, a much wider paradigmatic shift, if you want. Um, called open science, or you could call it like that, which is uh, on the verge of a breakthrough. Scientists are increasingly using these online platforms. However, um, I think we would all agree that it's still only a, a very small minority. It is a trend. And software tools, not only to, to blog or to tweet, uh, but also to conduct their research, the research itself, virtually. Um, they do not just stockpile the publications on the Institute's website, uh, but also share them with their peers, together with ongoing recommendations for literature findings, Hundreds of thousands of people, uh, hundreds of thousands of scientists nowadays worldwide, meanwhile, discuss on platforms like uh, Biomed Experts, Nature Network, uh, ResearchGate, thereby cultivating an increasingly collaborative research practice, collaboration, um, which often brings about totally new transdisciplinary knowledge networks, uh, connections between scientists or even um, citation cartels, so to say, uh, can be analyzed nowadays and visualized within seconds. Researchers have followers suddenly, which is something new, totally new to some of us. 
publicly showing their impact points, um, their journal impact points, as if it was their golf handicap. Um, some university chairs service their own TV channels nowadays on iTunes and uh, live out the new opportunities of public science as far as it can go. While the experts are still debating potential impact falsifications of scientific publishing through academic search engine optimization, as we've written in the introduction, some scientists are already making an intensive use of the new ways of publishing their publications up in the rankings and search results. Um, well, which of these trends in general uh, will be just a temporary fad or a hype and uh, which developments will substantially change the way research is being done in the long run? Uh, is the internet thereby returning, if you want, to its roots, like um, uh, Tim Berners-Lee's original concept of collaboration among scientific institutions, where it was all about uh, file sharing, so to speak? How can the public make use of academia's new transparency of a collaborative science? How can journalists find new subjects to cover or identify experts through the virtual networks? How can they use the Web 2.0 as a criterion for relevance or even as an early warning system? I would like to start um, the discussion with a couple of recent statistics which my colleagues from the research project on interactive science uh, in Germany, Wissenschaftskommunikation.info, presented just a few days ago. Um, they found out that three of three out of four scientists still use the good old mailing lists, which we all know, uh, um, to keep up to date with calls for papers, conference announcements. However, the, the usage is mainly passive. Um, it's got a, a statistic here. So these are... Uh, this the usage of... Um, of mailing lists nowadays, and on the on the on the one side here, which is the left side of you from you, on your left side, you see those who inform themselves about events, calls for papers, and so on. So more more than half of the scientists use mailing lists like that. Then you have the second, which is the red um, bar. Um, they inform themselves about new publications, research results, still a passive way of usage, and um, the green one is to communicate with colleagues, so a two-way communication. The last bit here, 3%, 3% of scientists actually use mailing lists to discuss scientific theses or research results before um, they are published um, officially. That's why I, I was saying rather um, passively. Mm -hmm. Another example, maybe um, we all know about science blogging. I've got a blog at Science Blogs as well. It still is a minority phenomen phenomenon because only 8% of scientists use blogs at all. Can you see it? Yeah. Which, um, yeah, which is, of course, less than one out of ten scientists. Those who use them, nonetheless, use them also mainly passively. So, if you look at this, you can see here, again, those, um, this is the blue bar here, those who write themselves regularly, blog posts, the red one is those who post commentaries on other people's blogs, and the green one is they just follow regularly the blog posts of other scientists. So again, um, those who use social media nowadays, those scientists, even if it's just a small fraction, those who use it still use it also passively. So I think that's what you call the legacy gap. There's a lot to learn um, and a lot, uh, a long way still to go.